What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and welcome to another episode of Walk in the Walk. And this time, it's the Sinister Smile Simulator known as We Happy Few. This is going to be a slightly shorter one because, of course, this is an early access title, but it is a title that has sort of adjusted what people's uh, ideas of it was going to be originally, from a heavily narrative kind of title to something that has got a narrative but is more procedurally generated. In many ways, the way they're doing this is somewhat like The Longest Dark, where The Longest Dark released its sort of sandbox and then later started adding more and more as they went forward. So We Happy Few is doing the same kind of thing. And I figured, you know what? It got released this morning in early access. It's really going to be a cool thing to do is to jump in here and look at this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk over the top of my playthrough and just discuss all of the artistic silence, graphic sound, music, and voice, and discuss really how they compare with what we thought was going to be offered as well as maybe what we saw in some trailers and some of the very few gameplay bits. So happiness is a country with no past. Um, when I get a chance, if there's something interesting, I'll go ahead and stop it so you can hear. One of the first things I think we notice when we look at this game, we've probably always noticed, is that there are certain similarities when it comes to the graphical stylings of games like the Bioshock series, but additionally, like No One Lives Forever, which is a slightly older title that some people may not have ever actually got to play. Uh, no One Lives Forever 2, I think, was on the PS1 or PS2, so you you obviously know uh, No One Lives Forever, the original, was even earlier than that. And so the first thing we do is, of course, get this idea of this guy sitting behind a desk, basically streaming out anything within newspapers that isn't acceptable and it, it's it's i think this is a really cool turn because it shows us right at the starting something completely odd is going on and they don't take very long to show this little snippet hastings brothers win scrap gathering prize and you are arthur and all of a sudden you start having these weird visions and one of the things that really interested me from the moment this starts is the fact that there are subtle hints that this might have been done to you on purpose now we won't know that until later we won't know if it's on accident or not but uh, i'll explain why here in a moment one of the things that astounds me right away is just how quickly we get different comparisons to not only the overarching control and uh, authoritarian feeling of, let's say, V for Vendetta, but you also get a bit of a Clockwork Orange style feel from the look of characters, as well, of course, as Anonymous. You get various different aspects when it comes to those masks that we're going to see in a second. Another thing that I really like about the masks is, of course, the social and science studies that have been done about people uh, who have no ability to, let's say, make or read uh, facial expressions and what that feels to be one of those people. There are actually people who can't read facial expressions. Uh, autism, that's one of the things that some people say is that they, they can't read facial expressions as well. And there's actually some diseases that cause issues where you can't really understand what's going on in somebody's face. So this idea that everybody's got these masks with the smiles is really, really creepy. And uh, of course, continues with, uh, in, in some ways, a very small amount as well with clowns, which has always freaked people out. It's a, a little bit more of a brusque kind of comparison, but one nonetheless. So she's offering you this joy, right? And one of the things I like about this is you find out as we go forward here, you're going to find out that one of your co-workers isn't really in love with you. And in fact, has sort of tried to get you in trouble. And we don't know yet, but there's, there's a couple strong hints in this early narrative that he has purposely or somebody has purposely messed with your joy because you still have the joy with you and you don't have to take it and instantly feel good. Uh, basically, you can uh, titterate down. And uh, so it seems interesting to me that you just suddenly are having, you know, all these visions and stuff like that just because you missed a quarter of a dose. It'll be interesting to find out. So I wanted to show you guys the re redaction machine. I love this machine. It it has such an etch-a-sketch look and really when you consider that when you think of an etch-a-sketch uh, etch-a-sketch you shake you can delete things the way you draw on an etch-a-sketch i'm assuming some of this is on purpose but i love the way in which you use the dials to dial it in in a very analog way you, you sort of dial it in like that and then you'll use the approve or, or disapprove to basically authorize it almost like erasing it from what you're looking at and moving it on of course some people say oh it's like papers please but i, I don't think that that uh, comparison is uh, you know this is just a momentary bit papers please of course is an entire game but i i, I like the way this is set up like an etch -a sketch and even the colors are generically the same the red and and the silver so drug trials a qualified success says sir robot as an early access title, one of the things that uh, the developers have spoken about is that the, the world is procedurally generated, so you have a different adventure every time. Now, 
What does that mean exactly? Well, we don't know because they've also in the same sentence stated that NPCs are all connected and have interlacing stories. So it may just be the town, which we'll look at in a second. I love the orange, red, and yellow color scheme. Very Walmart, Kmart, pleasant on the eyes, but old style 1970s shade carpet look. And even those are color coordinated, those drawers. There's something very cool about that. And we get that No One Lives Forever clean aesthetic that as we leave this area, we're going to start to see what the world really looks like. Now, this is a very cool medding out of data as we move forward you go from your office which is somewhat clean and tidy and doing work and you see this area here you see a little bit of grime but it's still got a no one lives forever look and then we start seeing things like this so first of all we get a lore found now this is talking about a little bit about mr hastings that's you and the idea of this person wanting to adjust their room now this is the person that i think there's some subtle cues they might have tried to mess with you on purpose Again, you start to see what the world really looks like without joy, and it's difficult to understand if you're actually seeing this visually or if this is just a visual representation of you slowly coming off the joy as you leave this first prologue, which I like. You, d you don't know. Um, oh, whoops. I didn't mean to sit down at the redactor here. Farm workers expected return from Germany. We'll approve one. Got to approve that one. Just everything approved. Approve. Government trying to kill people. Approved. I also love the analog flip clock. Man, I remember having one of those. I still remember when that's the way the clocks were. They weren't even, at the time, you know, you didn't even have the digital clocks. You had everything. Everything's got this analog mix to it, which I like. So anyway, getting up here, you start to see, as you look around, you see the joy, the pills left out, even in this person's office. But then you see this. One of the employees is sub, uh, subversive and maybe a downer. And Little shit. He wants my view. you hear that. But you also see this poster here in the top left corner uh, of you with devil uh, horns. And I was wondering if, if it is true, depending on how joy works, if it takes a little while, you know, did this person set you up? Because not only do you now see this memo, but as you move forward, things start to get pretty crazy when it comes to, you know, what what goes on if somebody is, and including this area here. This is one of your co-workers. And the story is, you know, the, the female that was talking to you before, I think she's probably your boss or co-worker. She told you this person's gone, and you're like, well, they've never come back. And you start to really see, look at this right here. Like, you, you see a mixture of different pictures and stuff up, almost like the person was just like you, slowly coming off their joy. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that the guy in the middle, in the office in the middle, I mean, are we going to find out that the entire game is based around some guy wanting your offices? Now, that's a reach, but I just want to say that that's what's cool, is you don't know. You're, you're sitting there going like, whoa, this is weird. And, of course, things are getting worse. Now we're seeing rotten food. We're seeing desiccated, uh, you know, different fruit bits. We're seeing flies. And it just gets worse. Now you're starting to see little bits of fog and smoke, paper laid everywhere. And, again, you're not 100% sure and we will never probably be sure if we're seeing something for real or if we're seeing it just uh, as a, a symbol of what the world really looks like, but we're on joy and we're coming out of this room because it just gets worse and it seems to be almost too perfect. Let's listen. Once they were drinking their daily rum with lime juice, well, they got to liking it. That was called grog. Yes, and that's why we Brits are called limeys, because we learn to put limes in our grog. Now, I personally don't know the art style uh, of why that guy looks that way, but he reminds me so much of Scorpius in, uh, what is that, Farscape. But again, here you see things starting to really fall apart, and you can tell uh, as you look you, that as as you make it through no one cares and then you see this scene which i'm going to let you guys listen to all the way through there you are you nearly missed the piñata it's the most adorable spanish custom uncle jack did a whole show about it you smash it until all the candy comes out come on hit it hit it hit it give it a whack hit it You are off your joy. Now, there's a couple reasons why this is fantastic. One, 
The pinata's fine. You hit it. It turns to blood, but the pinata for a moment stays there, and everything is obscured as you see them eating. Now, you already know something's up because you can see little bits, but I love the fact that it was a normal pinata. And then, of course, them screaming on the other side of the door. There's a, a really cool use of, of imagery when it comes to not only this, this, like, everything color-coordinated. You couldn't even get to the top. Why are these set up like this kind of thing? And then coming down here and uh, and crouching down and leaving this way. It, it's like, is this the only way of escape? Because technically, when you look at the way the level was made up, when you look at the past, this is technically pretty much, aside from the one locked door, the only way to get out. But the other locked door said, out for uh, lunch, I believe. Cops here, they, they, they believe in their job. Don't tase me, bro. So this is all a cutscene. It's going to show us, go ahead and go, uh, learn how to sort of, uh, well, swing, but not swing well, and introduce you, I guess, to the melee. And now something very interesting here. You get knocked out, and so you think, okay, the cops knocked me out. But guess where you wake up? Once again, there's some subtle things here that I think a lot of game players would just accept. But if you look at it, it, it ties into the story. You end up in a safe house. So the cops beat you up, but instead of, let's say, being hurt or, or something like that, you end up in a safe house. And I can't tell if that's just part of them not having the full story or if that's part of the story. Because I'm going to tell you right now, personally, for me, I think it'd be more interesting if that was part of the story. And we had to figure out why you end up getting beat up by the cops, but you suddenly end up in a safe house. Now, graphically, uh, you know, this is an early access title. We see a lot of texture pop in. It reminds me almost forcibly of Mass Effect 1. It's pop in in the Unreal Engine. And we're seeing uh, overarching Bioshock style atmospheric elements here, especially with the overall authoritarian voice coming across some type of technological bit. Let's listen. But of course, we'll interrupt the day because well, we love to do that <laughs> with our daily recreational activity. What are we going to do for fun today? Well, how about Simon Says? I love Simon Says, don't you? It's been too long since we've played it, hasn't it? Now, I'm a bit vague about the details. No, really. So, I think you ought to play it today, if, just to be sure. Well, you can never be too careful. So at three, gather in front of the telly for a rousing round of Simon Says. No, <laughs> wait! I didn't say Simon Says gather. No, stop! <laughs> That is almost ruthless in the way it delivers that information. It's Simon Says. Simon Says, possibly the most basic and rote copy style game that there is. And that's what he's having people play and then talking about everybody being a winner and everybody getting a prize. And there is just so many interactions there. Now, and, and that I like, really an overall feeling of, man, this place is scary. I mean, it's like the dumbing down of everything. And, of course, there's various movies and books and, and, and different bits of uh, entertainment that sort of line up for that. So let's talk a little bit about the HUD and the interaction with stuff. First of all, I like the HUD. It's, you know, you got the little bits to the right, the top and the left, and they're fairly, I would say, non-obtrusive. But the one thing that I do have an issue with, and it's only after I've played this a couple times, this little opening bit and sort of explored a little bit, that it's really become so in your face. And that's the fact that the inventory's boxes overlie everything. So when you look at something in the inventory, the box uh, that describes what it is, it it absolutely covers everything right there. Look at that. Like that that is just not what I like. Additionally, we talk about this in HUD design many times. You can't have small items all have somewhat the same shape. And once you gather a lot of items in a, a especially in a uncolored environment. So you have green, white, and black. That's what you've got here for this environment for the items. When you combine that with items that are somewhat the same shape and size, you get a confusion in the gamer's mind. And what happens is as a game is continually played, if you get into, let's say, an action scene, what can actually happen is the very couple extra moments that it takes a gamer to figure out that they want the meat versus the apple, or they want the pills versus the, uh, you, you know, the small bits of, of metal or whatever, what have you, what happens is that breaks you away from the game. And 
depending on where you are, what you're talking about, it could be called time attrition, but basically what happens is it removes the gamer from that element, from the, the quick jump in and out of the inventory element, if, as long as that's what they're wanting to do. Not We're not talking about crafting here. And what happens is many times they end up uh, complaining about that in forums. A lot of a lot of people don't really realize a problem with the HUD until they're many hours in, which is one of the reasons why I'm not a fan of quick looks, for example, because, uh, you know, HUD use, unless it's instantly noticeable, usually creeps up over time as a problem versus, let's say, in your first one, one maybe two hours. So here we start picking up notes, and again, because the story is not really fully in the game, we don't know if this is a full bit, but what I like is you get the two notes, and Mrs. Stokes talks about, you know, she, she has this little bit that seems sort of haunting where she's seen somebody run around, and then she talks about her, her husband being sort of useless. But then you get the second bit of the note, and at the end she says, why did I marry such an idiot? I miss him so much. And it reminds you a, a lot of, you know, bickering uh, spouses and that kind of thing, which I really like. Now, this doesn't really have a lived-in feel at all. It is just a safe house, so if anybody's, you know, wondering why there's just a bed, maybe no food, that kind of thing, you do get things like this. You get the little box, but uh, we'll sleep. Now, I lay me down now sleep. the reason why I sleep is I want to show you guys something. Uh, you feel hungry. So any game uh, is sort of its mechanics and its gameplay elements as they loop continually and as they as they sort of blossom out and you get more and more gameplay loops like let's say i mention this all the time but it's a game that isn't widely loved but has excellent gameplay loops which is state of decay right up until you pretty much win it you're learning new things so gameplay loops are very important and the gameplay loop in a survival game is usually going to be around a couple things. Is it going to be around constantly getting more and more powerful with skills and abilities so that the things you used to need to make, you can make better ones, that kind of thing? Or is it going to be, you know, solely wrapped around your health and, and your tiredness and your water and your basic needs? This is weird because this is a social stealth game. Let's remember that. A social stealth game. And yet at the same time you get thirsty and hungry insanely fast. And so my hope is that they're really looking at that. Of course, here we're getting a lot of uh, automatic prompts, recipe unlocked and stuff like that. I, my personal opinion is this area is probably just a placeholder for them to get people into the game because some of the stuff seems, uh, it, it could just be teaching you, but it's like, you need to go here. You need to grab this to do this. You need to go to the maintenance locker here. So it'll be interesting to see again, if this is actually in the main game once it all once it all is said and done. And let's leave. So we're gonna go ahead and go out. Um, we're, we're gonna look around. One of the first things I have to say is, boy, you know, uh, talking about art influences of, of different games, uh, uh, including Bioshock for sure, there's a very real fable feeling to this. And uh, I think it's not only the color scheme, but the soft rounded corners to various items. And of course, architecture, that has a particular bent to it, a particular look to it, will usually remind you uh, of other games where it, there's a like-for-like like kind of architecture, and we certainly see that here. We don't see the crone step architecture, which is that haunted look where homes are sort of creeped in on one another and they're bent in, but there is definitely a uniqueness to the architecture that isn't straight, which, once again, does a very good job of lending that ethereal sort of alien feeling to everything. Now, let's listen to this music as it crops up. Now, there's a couple reasons why I love that. First is the layering. I love the fact that at first you have the instruments, you have a synth, and you have a piano, and a piano playing a very, very simple little ditty. 
Is I mean, it's that simple. You just call it a ditty. And it's playing that separate, and then they get closer and closer together until they're sort of playing over the top of each other. And there's some velocity changes and some uh, some overall tonal country. changes there as well. And it it's really, really cool. It's It's got a bit of a discordant feel, especially with the synth. The synth has a couple notes in there that I wasn't expecting. But I like the fact that it's ambient, but there is still something going on. It's just not complex enough to really get in the way of any one thing. It's just there, and it, it's very subdued but noticeable. So let's listen to some voices. It's easy. You, you take the goats across first. Toys and tiny beds. Tiny so, beds we meet again. Why'd you take the vanilla? You know it doesn't Ah, but where's Kilroy when you need him, eh? Toys and tiny beds. <laughs> so, uh, listen, whether that has anything to do with the the fact that we don't know the story or what, th the entire time you're playing this demo or early access, you are going to be consistently surprised by the craziness that you hear people say. It, most of it will make no sense at all. Now, there are a couple allusions to other games I've noticed, so there is that. But for the most part, you are many times just like, what the F is going on? However, a little bit later, there's a, a, some different aspects that you're going to find. Uh, I probably won't have it in this video, but things start to make sense uh, in, in a weird way of why that's such a dichotomy. So now, let's talk a little bit once again about architecture. Now, we went from the clean but cluttered architecture to a lived-in architecture, but... You know, humans love things that are categorized, easily referenced, right? We like things to make sense. And when they don't, especially in a cohesive way, when there's a large amount of things that match up, but match up in a way that don't make sense to us, it's very off-putting. And what I love about this is when you look at this, you see like candles burning next to a couch, a mannequin, and a freaking opening with a bunch of ferns in it. And it makes you go like, does nobody care about this place? Is that what's going on? Like they're just living do they see where they're living and what they're you know are they seeing the realistic view do they see the opening do they see the grass in their house that kind of thing and it, it speaks to mania it speaks to various different mental illnesses of not understanding the reality around you which i think is really really interesting as well now here we're going to grab uh of course, every game, survival game, has to have some kind of place that you can build more things than you could build normally, right? I mean, I think that's pretty much normal. And as we start to see, you, you've got the typical... I, I, first of all, I want to say, you know, I did talk about the HUD and having some issues with the inventory. I don't necessarily have an issue with the construction. I think that's pretty okay. Construction here makes perfect sense to me. I think that when you get a lot of items to construct, it could be hard. It's just this right here. Uh, the the, the, the three-color scheme and the small items and all, many of the items looking like they could be somewhat close to one another in, in shape and, and how they overall appear, as well as the larger writing. I would love to see that repaired a little bit. I would love to see that cleaned up. You can't really do transparencies because they've gone with a paper mache background style. If you notice that, it looks like paper cut out. It looks like ch child's paper cut out, which technically fits the artistic scheme of everything, which is a childlike joy and happiness despite all of the crap around them. So I get why they chose that. But Now, when it talks to procedural generation, let's discuss that for a second. It, it certainly seems to me like it is the city, which I haven't seen this. I haven't seen anybody say, oh, the city is 100% procedurally generated, okay? But finding like rubber duckies in the toy here and looking at the way things are set out when somebody creates a level even if they create discord they create what's basically called human discord as in you can tell a human lived here even if that human is crazy right versus an explosion when an explosion goes off shit goes everywhere when a person goes off the rails many times they go off the rails slowly they come even if they're coming off their meds and Trust me, I actually know some people who are like this, where things start to fall apart. You can sort of test the waters and realize this person is is falling down kind of thing. And what happens in this area is it looks like shit exploded. And so that's why I think most of this is most likely all the procedural generated stuff and Hopefully the NPCs will not be. I do like all of this kind of uh, overarching mess that we've got, but at times it actually looks less lived in and more exploded. And I think that uh, you, what's nice about most procedural generated levels, procedural uh, generation within a game, almost anybody who works on procedural generation will tell you this, there's various integers you can enter in, there's various seeds you can create, we'll, talk, we'll call them those, where you can choose the anarchy, the chaos, the overall chaos that is created within an area. Do you want a high chaos area or do you want a somewhat chaotic area 
And I think that maybe turning that down a little bit might help. But again, we haven't gone to the nicer places within this game world. So I want to make sure that's clear. This is the down and out the dregs. I love this look. Again, Fable, the colored light, uh, those fireflies. This all has a spectacular look. And I'm telling you right now, I would love to play this even if it was in the VR uh, virtual theater. I would love to play this in VR and look around and run around in VR with some head, head look. So here we find out that there's other people that are sort of like us. That, that's the thing is there's a lot of questions about what's going on because these people are talking about like a, sort of a secret group, a secret meeting, and you're not 100% sure exactly where they're going with things and who you can trust, which I like. Uh, you know, social survival, right? A, a social survival game. Unfortunately, at the same time, it's also a filtered water and strange meat game where you end up having to eat all those. So it'll be, it's going to be really interesting to see how these play together. Graphically, I have to say, and the overall game style, there's a fantastic look to everything. And I think that uh, even myself, I, I completely understand that you, we won't be able to assume that much of this will have a realistic Please look to things. Perry, but tomorrow, you may be in the Garden District. <laughs> I love the fact that he's coming unhinged. Like, you, you're all, hmm. That, he sounds like he's coming unhinged, which is very cool. And here we see... Uh, you know, basically what you have is a bunch of very dirty, nasty safes in this area as homes. What do I mean by that? Well, it, it, it's a joke that some of us make when we were talking in the past about making levels in certain dirty areas, rundown areas where many times, uh, you know, people do want to keep their stuff safe. But if there's a hole in the wall, how do you keep it safe, right? The reason why I think a lot of this is procedurally generated is because, of course, you see many buildings with no way to get in, but they're in such a state of disrepair. And it's sort of like a bunch of dirty safes where you get this idea that everybody's inside holding their, you know, their, their coolables right next to their chest and just hoping you don't try to get in the door. Unfortunately, procedural generation usually has some negative uh, connotations when it comes to creating a, a believability, a, a sort of a linear feel of real world, which means many of the places you can't get into. So it, it does feel weird, or you get these stock buildings to the right in a section that looks far larger than the building itself. And that usually can hint towards a procedural generation system over the top of a layered uh, a layered location. So you make that map, you sort of draw some grids, and then you say, put some buildings in there. Uh, now, some high, super good procedural generation might say, change the size of the block itself so that you don't have wasted space, but it doesn't look like that here. I like it. I mean, I, I just so everybody knows, you know, if, if you think that uh, any of this is negative, it's not. Um, it's just very interesting how 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 the, it'll be put into question just what is procedurally generated until it happens, until we are told basically exactly what is and isn't. Let's uh, see if we can hear some ambient sounds here. So a couple things. I love the HUD when that pop up, when the notification comes up, it sounds like that metal bowl, like somebody, like a big fruit bowl, somebody rubbing their finger around the rim. You get a roll sound to it, which is very, very cool. And it's, it's so tonal. There's so many different tones. Also, I don't know if you guys could hear, but you could hear seagulls from the ocean nearby and stuff like that. And then of course, a constant from the wind blowing through the trees that we actually see. All right. So let's take him out. Now, these quests also make me wonder if they're random because you see these just sort of pop up and it'll be interesting to see if they're an ambient style system like uh, Skyrim. Enhanced rock. Just whack him on the head. Now, Pachango. And back alive. <laughs> so uh, what's interesting here is I, I think when you look at the situation... You have this rock thrower. We're going to go ahead and try to take him out. But we see something really strange happen. And I can't tell if it's the game pushing a non-violent stance or, or a non-super violent stance. But boom. We defeated the rock chucker. And he's gone. Now, we get attacked by his friends. And that makes me wonder what's going on here. Because when we get attacked, what happens? Well, we get gang beat up. We don't get killed. And that's what's, that, that's what's interesting to me. Just sort of trying to figure out exactly why that is and how death is exactly handled because, uh, I, I, you know, basically getting knocked out before you die kind of thing. So it'll be interesting to see how it all comes together. 
I love the fact that they remind me of cartoon Fallout. If, if you if you look at their clothing, the scavenger clothing, right? It's it's got that. And I'm I'm doing a good job poking these guys, plain and simple. I mean, the fact is, is they just keep running forward, and I just keep saying like, I'm gonna poke you, I'm gonna poke you, I'm gonna poke you, and then you feel thirsty as you die. The thirst is real. <laughs> but like altered beast, rise from your grave. Coming back, picking up a lovely bouquet that somebody must have dropped got it so again you know looking at uh the the different elements of survival like i said you know depending on your thirst your hunger that kind of thing there's different elements of survival games that can be out there is the game going to be about the physical going to be about the mental going to be about building going to be about crafting going to be about just keeping yourself alive how fast do you get tired how fast do you get hungry can you level up well one of the things i haven't seen in the game is any kind of skill system so if that's true, then there's a couple different things we can hope for. One, we can hope for some kind of food that causes us to not get hungry for a while, uh, like a specific food. Because otherwise, it's going to be like you need to go to Weight Watchers or something because you're just drinking and eating and drinking and eating and drinking and eating. So, love this look here. And once again, we see that little off-skew architecture in a couple places where you can see it's got a tiny bit of a bent to it, but not too much to, to sort of have a maniacal or sinister slant to the homes, but just enough to give you that cobblestone, shit isn't built straight, slightly bent worldview. Who needs sleep? So, the, I, I just... The fact that the mental pills, the pills that are called Joy, are actually called DSM in the inventory cracks me the hell up. Uh, that's a, obviously an insider joke towards the DSM booklet for mental disorders, which just cracks me up. Oh, and that uh, <laughs> that sign was floating in the middle of the space. I, and I love this. Now you're trotting along. You The sun is brighter. People are like, but here's the thing. I wish Joy worked on me. That makes me question... You know, are the people who are the down and out down and out because they choose to like you, you chose to. You're like, I don't want to take any more because what I'm seeing is pretty terrible, even though I just took some now. Are they down and out for that reason? Or are they down and out because joy doesn't work on them anymore? The drug doesn't work on them anymore. It's like they've got a, a, an immunity to Iocane powder. It's going to be really interesting. I love the rainbow in the sky. It's just just hilarious. This entire outlook uh, and the trot, the you know the, the the hipster trot that you got going, like da, da, da. you you've got the Leonardo DiCaprio happy walk through the streets going on here. This is great, but again, very procedurally generated looking, especially even a place like this with the way everything is. Sort of, uh, if you guys have played a lot of games, many times you'll see a game where it'll have an option called the decal. How long do decals stay? Well, what happens in a uh, procedurally generated world is everything is a decal. And it, it, that includes rugs and explosions and stuff that's on the walls and stuff that's on the floor. And what can happen is decals almost never look natural unless they're placed naturally, right? And you can sort of see the issues. Now, I love the fact that the door is busted in. That looks like, you know, somebody busted into this place. You can see the door down there. But you get some weirdness, like the girl uh, on the ledge it right there in front of us that can't get off. And so you definitely get some weird aspects. Yeah, this is just all such so great looking. It'll be interesting to play. You know, we we really haven't got a social stealth game. So regardless of any of these kind of issues, it'll at the very least be interesting to check out. But it's one of the reasons why you guys don't see me do a lot of uh, quick looks because a game like this, uh, if somebody, you know, I've seen a couple quick looks myself and they just don't really tell me anything about the game. It's going to be, uh, there's going to be far more involved, just like you guys. I may be talking a certain way when I do a walk in the walk, but it's the same stuff you guys think when you're playing it, right? I mean, the, the long story short, if somebody said, hey, I'm going to go and tell you how cool the first hour of Final Fantasy 77 was, I'd say, well, that'll be awesome because that'll just be the first hour you'll be able to talk about. Anything after that won't make any sense. So uh, gameplay loops are really important, and it's super important to see how they mature throughout the entire title. So even the stuff I'm pointing out, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see if it changes. Anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys like this video. It's going to be short because, of course, it is an early access title. If you did like the video, hey, share it, uh, you know, whether it be Reddit, on, on Twitter, on Facebook. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike the video, give it a thumbs down. Remember, I have a patron if you like that kind of thing. If you don't, hey, just stop by, say hi, talk about the video. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.